Anzac Day, a day of reunion, a gathering of old mates, comrades, survivors of one of the most fascinating units in the history of Australia's fighting forces. Amazingly, some of these men have never met. They're the men of Z Special Unit. Today, 40 years after the war, they marched together for the very first time. He was in Z Force. He still won't say what it was all about, but he, was, he would never march, he would never go to the RSL until this year because they weren't allowed to say anything about it all. He still don't know. He still won't say very much. There he comes, there he comes. Oh, they're in our way. Come on, out of our way. We've waited years for this. You wouldn't have Come on, you fellas. Good on you fellas. Hello, Ray. Hello, darling. Hello, Ray. <laughs> These men fought deep behind enemy lines in a very secret war, under strict orders to speak to no one. Now, for the first time, some details are emerging. One of the remarkable stories taken from Special Force files involves this small vessel. Fifty years ago, she was a Japanese fishing boat, the Kafuka Maru, one of hundreds operating out of the port of Singapore. Japan was to enter the war, and Japanese forces swept down through the Pacific and the Malay Peninsula. This boat, packed with refugees, escaped just in time. In 1943, she was refitted in Australia and given the name Crite, after a deadly Indian snake. A very apt name, because Crite was to be given a very deadly purpose. Of the 14 Z Special Unit men who sailed on a bowl mission, codenamed Jaywick, only four survived. Crite took them within sight of enemy held Singapore, where six members paddled canoes right into the harbour to blow 40,000 tonnes of Japanese shipping sky high. Incredibly, this old ship got them home again. This is their story. At the beginning of 1942, as the Japanese advanced rapidly through Southeast Asia, few people in Singapore felt insecure. It was British founded, British garrisoned, an important strategic link between East and West. No one thought it would ever fall. Singapore was bombed. Antiquated British biplanes were shot out of the sky. The enemy had exploited the element of surprise by advancing overland. The British had expected and planned for an attack by sea. A shocked populace could only stand and watch helplessly. The defences faced the wrong way. The highly mobile Japanese swept down the jungle trails and in February, Australian forces under British command were ordered to retreat as the enemy advanced upon Singapore with frightening speed. On the 15th of that month, the city fell. The garrison surrendered. One of the worst defeats in modern British military history. Thousands of servicemen and women became prisoners of war. The defeat was humiliating. The Australians wanted to fight, but the order came through to lay down their arms. They did as they were told. Almost overnight, more than 22,000 fit fighting men became prisoners. A great number of Australians were imprisoned in Changi on Singapore Island. For them, the war had ended and three years of hell had begun. During the next three years, they were to endure deprivation and degradation beyond belief. They were virtually slaves, forced labour on Japanese military projects such as the Burma Railway, where thousands were to die of ill-treatment, malnutrition and disease. Thousands more were taken to Borneo, where almost all of them perished on the infamous Sandakan Death March. Elsewhere, other Australians were still free to fight, trying to stem the advancing tide, but it seemed to be a losing battle. A 
Australia itself was now threatened, under siege. The samurai sword had almost completely severed our connections with the outside world. Singapore was now very firmly in the enemy hands. One imperial master had replaced another. Streets that had witnessed English pomp and ceremony now echoed to the stamp of Japanese boots. But not all the former British population had become prisoners. Some had managed to escape by sea as the enemy advanced. Many small craft were sunk, but others got away. Ivan Lyon of the Gordon Highlanders helped organise an escape route. Lyon noticed a fishing vessel, the Kafuka Maru, and it struck a chord in his mind because Lyon had a plan. Later he came across the ship again, renamed it Trite after a venomous snake, and set his ideas in motion. Most and Berryman, Joe Jones, Horry Young, Taffy Morris are together on board Trite for the first time in more than 40 years. A dramatic operation in 1943 has forged in the minds of these men a firm link with the past. Taffy Morris, Lyons as Batman, remembers. There's a feeling about it, there's an atmosphere immediately uh, which seems to permeate one and uh, I don't know, it's a, it's a feeling that uh, you wouldn't be the least bit surprised to see the others somehow uh, reappear. Fourteen men were all hand-picked, men who were reliable, men who could be trusted, men of the caliber of Lieutenant Donald Davidson, Lieutenant Ted Cass, Lieutenant Bob Page, Corporal Taffy Morris, Acting Able Seaman Popper Falls, Leading Telegraphist Hurry Young, Leading Stoker, Paddy McDowell. Acting Leading Seaman, Cobber Kane. Corporal Andy Crilly. Acting Able Seaman, Moston Berryman. Acting Able Seaman, Booth Marsh. Acting Able Seaman, Arthur Joe Jones. Acting Able Seaman, Happy Houston. And Lion himself the boss. He had the men and now training could begin for one of the most audacious missions of the war, Operation Jaywick. The Hawkesbury River, New South Wales, Australia. A long way from the front lines, from the Japanese, from prying eyes, an ideal place to train for a top secret, dangerous, waterborne mission. Here Lyon and Davidson worked the men hard because their lives depended on it. Joe Jones remembers. Most of our training was done in um, an area about 25 mile north of Sydney at Broken Bay. Uh, this was um, a perfect spot for our type of training. We also conducted our um, um, own uh, firing range, we had army uh, experts down there to teach us all about Tommy guns, Owen guns, uh, explosives, and um, combat. We spent a couple of weeks here being uh, pulled around and thrown around by um, army ex-wrestlers who took a great delight, I think, in um, uh, having Navy personnel there for the first time, and uh, I think they got a lot of pleasure in uh, taking it out on us. But the main part of our training was on um, canoe work and uh, a lot of uh, physical training and uh, hill climbing. And uh, the final stage of our training uh, was completed at Cairns, where we had uh, a lot of training putting limpet mines on the, uh, the Liberty ships. At last the training was over. Trite was refitted and ready for sea. It was going to be a long voyage. The men were ready, ready for anything. But Lyon had not yet told them where they were going or what they were to do. Trite sailed north from Cairns, then west, around the top end and down to Exmouth Gulf in Western Australia. Morale was high, but their mission was still shrouded in mystery. 
Only Lyon and Davidson, Page and Cass knew. Rumours were rife, but one thing was clear. They would soon be in enemy territory. Horry Young. It would have been probably about the 5th of September after Crite had cleared Exmouth Gulf that uh, Major Lyons cleared lower deck, summoned all the crew forward and told them that uh, the destination of Crite was Singapore and they were going to attack shipping in Singapore Harbour. We were all um, somewhat taken aback. It was a bit of a shock, really. We, we, uh, <laughs> a lot of us thought we might go as far as, say, Surabaya, um, but the thought of going as far as uh, Singapore uh, uh, took us all a bit by surprise. Now the men of Jaywick knew why Lion had chosen the Kafuka Maru. Japanese designed, Japanese built, she'd blend into the seascape without arousing suspicion. At least they hoped she would, and flying a Japanese flag would help. As the days passed, Crite headed north at a steady five knots, each hour taking them further from home and safety. Life on board settled into a tense, watchful routine. Confined by the inactivity of shipboard life, they felt their hard-won physical fitness ebbing away. Lion, as always, aloof, no doubt thinking of his wife and child, prisoners of the Japanese. They were in enemy waters now. Security was paramount. A lot, a lot of little things that you had to watch, like those that smoked not throwing their cigarette butts overboard, they floated for 24 hours. All the uh, tin foodstuffs uh, had the labels taken off them and uh, the tins were labelled with a, a suitable number and uh, the cook was able to identify whether it was baked beans or uh, sardines or whatever simply by the number. And uh, we were wearing uh, sarongs, native clothing, and our skin was stained with a black dye pr provided by uh, the Helena Rubenstein organisation. This filthy stain! <laughs> when we put this on, it was absolutely huge. <laughs> it is terrible. It's and I think it was probably the, the most humorous day of the trip. Yeah. Everyone took a grim delight in getting a swab of cotton wool and tipping this <laughs> dye on it and uh, having a go at, the, at their mates, you know, and making sure that every part was covered with this dye. And we mean every part. <laughs> and yeah. with, with stinging success. <laughs> it did not get more stinging A in his face. <laughs> <laughs> For a while there, there were fellows that looked like Malays with white private parts. It looked a bit funny for a while. There was much rival comment about uh, people trying to look like Dorothy L'Amour, particularly uh, wearing a sarong, and uh, a couple of the chaps started to do a bit of a hurler on the foredeck and uh, caused quite a, a lot of laughter and joking. But the laughter concealed tension that became almost unbearable as Crite steamed on. This is the island of Noosa Bazaar, at the southern entrance to Lombok Strait. Crite would have to sail through here, uncomfortably close to two major enemy airfields. One at Den Bazaar on the island of Bali, the other at Malang on Lombok. The area was crawling with Japanese, thousands of men well entrenched. We weren't too sure what was there, but uh, the idea was to be well clear of there so there'd be no hassles um, going through, and right. it was uh, a little bit hairy. The night that was chosen to go through the Lombok Strait was the night that the rip was going in towards Borneo, and we, making the grand speed of five, five and a half knots, didn't want a rip hitting us head on at four or five knots. But somewhere along the line, the, the calculations were uh, were wrongly worked out and when we started to get into the rip proper it was coming out at practically the same speed as we were heading into it. Consequently we were, weren't making any headway at all. Very very slowly we made our way through it but instead of being well clear 
of this Lombok Strait by morning, we were still in the middle of it. Kreit inched her way through, fighting against the current, past the observation posts under the searchlight beams. The enemy was watching them. They knew and they crossed their fingers and hoped that they would pass their first real test. At any moment they expected to hear the roar of guns as the batteries opened up, but nothing happened. Kreit sailed on, unchallenged, and by morning they were through. We sailed Kreit up to the very edges of the captured citadel of Singapore, and, and uh, we were looking for a place to hide Kreit so as we could drop our canoe parties off. And of course, uh, uh, a personal uh, aspect uh, where I was concerned, having left Singapore during uh, the catastrophe of the capitulation, uh, uh, it, it was uh, amazing to my inner self that here we were, back when the Japanese were at their strongest, and this was one of their strongest uh, strongholds outside of Japan itself. It was absolutely amazing, and this proved the point of where Lyons' conception of audacity. They must have felt rather secure, I think. Um, um, well, I think the feeling was that they were a thousand miles from their front line, which was well down in New Guinea at the time. They thought they were the masters. Kreit sailed on under the dubious protection of the Japanese flag, lion on the lookout for a place to offload their canoes. Kreit was now very close, dangerously close, so close that they could clearly see the glow of the city lights in the night sky. No blackouts here. The Japanese were secure from attack, or so they thought. But the men of Jaywick had other ideas. Phase two swung into action. The foal boats were assembled, light, collapsible, canvas-covered canoes that would take them on the final leg of their journey. The canoe teams were issued with tablets, cyanide tablets, to be used if capture was inevitable. One bite and death would follow within seconds. They were not under orders to swallow. We were all confident we could do the job, but there was a little doubt, I think, in everyone's mind that uh, after doing a job like that, um, that the Japanese wouldn't close the net around you and. Um, uh, you know, that we'd be very uh, lucky to, to get away, really. Operation Jaywick packed quite a wallop. Limpet mines, each capable of blowing a sizeable hole in the side of a ship. Magnetic time bombs with fuses that could be preset, allowing the canoe parties to get safely away. At last the time came for the canoes to set out. Taffy Morris recalls the feelings of those aboard Kite who watched them go. My thoughts were with them and wishing them the very best of luck. And although uh, looking at our particular side of it wasn't exactly without hazards, what they were about to attempt we considered extremely dangerous and we certainly wish them every possible success and our best thoughts went with them. I think too, you know, when you look back on it, that it was a pretty sad occasion. Well, in a way, because we didn't know whether they were coming back or not. Kreit was on her own and Ted Cass turned her bow towards the sea. For two weeks she'd be in limbo, hiding among the maze of islands, seeking to keep a low profile and to avoid the attention of the Japanese. But she'd be back to rendezvous and they all hoped that the canoes would be there to meet them. After the Kreit left us at Panjang Island, the idea was to do all our canoeing by night and lay up in the mangroves during the day uh, to avoid being seen by the local natives who we weren't too sure whether they were going to be friendly and probably the Japanese 
also would have had uh, uh, one of their own informers planted in most of the larger uh, campongs in the area. And so a mangrove-ridden swamp became the waiting point. So were their days spent, some sleeping, some awake. One man looked at the pass. The resolution showed in his face. It was very much part of his spirit. We had quite a bit of trouble with a Japanese patrol boat. It used to patrol through Bill uh, Straits every evening. The sound of its diesel engines could be heard for miles away and the first night that we left Panjang, the canoes all loaded, ready to go, and along came this patrol boat again and uh, uh, we had to get the canoes back in behind the mangroves. Having dropped the canoe parties, Cright then sailed off towards the coast of Borneo for her just to sail up and down quietly in the shallows of the Borneo coastline. Cright became uh, quite a, uh, an identity, we felt, in, in those waters. We had been cruising up and down for quite a few days uh, looking for a spot to hide her. But uh, and nobody paid any attention. We passed Japanese observation posts. The vessel was clearly seen by Japanese naval pinnaces and the local populace and uh, obviously the vessel was quite accepted by the people there and uh, we felt quite secure. Jeez, what's that mate? Bang of the suit next together mate. My God. Tastes better than it looks. As the days passed, fatigue set in. 50 kilometres is a long way to paddle a canoe in tropical heat. Muscles, unused aboard Crite for so many weeks, ached. Blisters on hands and buttocks, rubbed raw. Mangroves, mud and mosquitoes added to misery. After three nights of uh, paddling by night and uh, hiding behind the mangroves by day, we eventually reached uh, Dongas Island, about eight miles across from Singapore Harbour. Uh, a Japanese convoy came in, uh, sitting across there looked a beautiful um, target for us, but we, uh, we attacked that night and the tide was so strong against us that we uh, had to abort the attack about one o'clock in the morning. And uh, we made back for Dongas Island. The, the following night we moved our base to a, an island uh, closer to the harbour and where we could uh, uh, use the tide, the slack water and the tide, to assist us to get across to the harbour. We left Suba Island and paddled across towards the Singapore Harbour area. Halfway across to the uh, shipping area, the canoes parted, the three canoes, uh, Davidson and Falls going to the examination anchorage, anchorage. Lyons and Houston, they were to come in to the Book and Wharf area and Bob Page and myself were to attack ships anchored off Book and Wharf and also uh, ships, any suitable ship tied up to the Book and Wharf area. There was no blackouts, the wharf area was lit up and we could clearly see Japanese sentries moving up and down the wharf. It looked as though uh, it would be almost impossible to paddle into the wharf and attack Japanese ships here.
It was a difficult operation. The limpets had to be placed below the waterline where the explosives could have the most damaging effect. And all this was in sight and earshot of the Japanese. Generally the best procedure was to, uh, any ship that was anchored would be laying with the tide, was to come up from the stern, paddle up to halfway along the ship under the engine room. Uh, the man in the forward part of the canoe was to attach the hull fast, hold it with one hand and to push the canoe out with the other hand. Uh, the operator in the stern of the canoe then, with a, a, a long six foot rod, lowered the limpets down underwater as far as he could and gradually eased the magnets onto the side of the ship. The third ship that we put our minds on uh, was probably about 500 yards away from the other ship. And this one proved no problems at all. It was well loaded, low down the water. It was very dark around it. Uh, this was a great relief to us to have done the three ships over. We could only hope that the other canoes had as much success as we did. They hid on Donga's Island all the next day. At nightfall, they set out again. Their rendezvous with Trite was a few days and a long, painful paddle away. We paddled uh, from nine in the morning till about uh, three o'clock the following morning, um, just having a rest, five minute rest every hour, uh, before we eventually arrived at um, Pompom Island, the rendezvous. And uh, after all that paddling, everyone was really um, uh, exhausted. We just crawled up on the beach, pulled our canoes up, and uh, just collapsed on the beach. We had heard nothing on the radio which would indicate to us whether the raid on the shipping in the harbour had been successful or no, or indeed whether our colleagues in the canoes had perhaps been captured and may have... Um, uh, divulged information about how they became to be taken into the area. So uh, when the vessel arrived at P Pong Pong Island, um, we weren't too sure whether we were going to, what sort of a reception committee we were going to meet, whether they were going to be our colleagues or whether they were going to be a, a Japanese welcoming committee. We did arrive there that the night the Crichton came in to pick up uh, Davidson and uh, Falls, but we were on the southern end of the island and the rendezvous was further around. But that was the, as far as we could make it that night. Actually, the rendezvous had been set up, um, well, when we left the Crichton originally at Panjang, uh, and the fact that um, Lyons' canoe had had a couple of cracked ribs in it and uh, this slowed us down a little bit. It, it was a great feeling to. Um, to see the crowd come into the bay, uh, just cruised in a dark shape, and um, uh, it was great to be back on board, and uh, we, we got a terrific well. It's uh, very hard to describe precisely what we did feel at the moment, but uh, the, uh, the primary feeling was one of great relief. Great jubilee. With an estimated 40,000 tonnes of Japanese shipping at the bottom of Singapore Harbour, no casualties, and Crite now heading for home, all on board relaxed, but not for long. Unfortunately, round about midnight, just after we'd gotten into the strait, the lookout happened to glance astern and noticed uh, what appeared to be a sail um, coming up astern of Crite. Uh, he uh, drew the attention of the officers to this uh, sail. They had a look at it through glasses and very quickly reasoned that it was the bow wave of a very fast ship coming up. The ship turned out to be a Japanese destroyer, approximately 3,000 tonnes, and the uh, destroyer came up very rapidly, 
onto uh, Kreitz Port Quarter. Yeah, f f 50 oh, yards. Close, very close. 50 yards. Yeah. It was looming. We could uh, see. You could yes. see. Even on a dark night without any light, you, you, you could see it was looming. the whole outline. I, I think that you could have lobbed grenades on the deck without any trouble. I've got a rude awakening to get my Bren gun. We had visitors. Mm. Well, I jumped up, grabbed my Bren, see everybody around me crouched down with their their various weapons. And uh, I can remember quite vividly going down to the stern and Krilly, our cook, was sitting there just not knowing what to do. I'm sure he was saying, it's too big for me, it's too big for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, good, good Catholic man he was at the time. Too, too big, too big. It paced us for, um, oh, for about five minutes. Didn't challenge us. Uh, obviously we must have looked uh, a bit familiar with our Japanese flag flying. But uh, I can tell you all the boys were pretty scared at the time. Of course, uh, what we realised, what we'd realised right from the time we'd left Australia, that uh, any apprehension whatsoever, when you consider we had no identity whatsoever, we had no uniforms, we were flying a Japanese flag, we were in enemy territory, so we could only expect one result if the worst occurred. Uh, Lyons was summing up the situation when he saw the patrol boat. It, it could right. have been the end and uh, he was prepared to uh, hand oh. his cyanide yes. tablets out. Were you going to take a tablet? Uh, well, not, at the, not at the time. Yeah. Uh, it was self-preservation at that. I remember with the wireless equipment there that was sitting on top of it a very large amount of plastic explosive and uh, this was so arranged to um, explode uh, very, very briefly if it was actuated. And I was thinking to myself, well, somebody presses the pin on this uh, bit of plastic 808. <laughs> I'm not too sure where I'm going to finish. <laughs> Same plan for all I, I, I don't think any of us would have done really much all more in that time. We're all heading in the same direction. <laughs> yes. Suddenly, inexplicably, the destroyer turned and moved away, vanishing into the gloom as mysteriously as she had appeared. Why she didn't challenge Crite, no one will ever know. On Lyon's orders, Horry Young broke radio silence to tap out a message which read, ACNB from Crite. Mission completed for Admiral Christie, Lombok now patrolled. Stop. ETA PM 17th. Operation Jaywick was over. But there were no fanfares, no medals, little praise. The story didn't make the headlines until 1946, one year after the war. Even close family members didn't know, as Mrs Ray Grimwade recalls. It came as a great shock to the family and to most of the families. We first found out that Andrew was involved in the Jaywick raid when it was on the front page of the daily newspaper. I remember one afternoon when my brother, Andrew Houston, or Happy as the boys called him, he returned home and he'd met up with several of his friends and they'd had a reunion in town together. It wasn't until some years later that we found out that this was the party held when they had returned from the Jaywick raid. This party was actually held at the Myagunya homestead. This is Myagunya. It's a very old home, it's a very historic home. It's a unique piece of Australia. Today it is a museum. It was here at Myagunya that shortly before Christmas in 1943 that the men of Operation Jaywick gathered together for a simple but well-merited celebration. The most stringent security had surrounded Operation Jaywick. There had been no publicity, there had been no acclaim. Not that that worried Ivan and Lyon and his magnificent compatriots. Lyon was already planning, preparing to go back to Singapore to destroy more Japanese ships. 
I have a copy of a letter here from Lieutenant Davidson congratulating my brother on his medal. And in that letter, he states that he hopes they were having a, he was having a good leave. And he also states, I have not lost you yet. Ivan Lyon took several JWIC men with him on Operation Rimau, Houston and Marsh, Bob Page, Popper Falls, Donald Davis. The mission was named after the tiger tattooed on Lyon's chest. When he flexed his muscles, the animal appeared to snarl. Another man on Operation Rimau was Corporal Campbell. We knew that last time that, that uh, he was on a dangerous mission, but we had no idea of what it was about. He spoke to us about his uh, uh, parachute dropping. We knew then that he was a trained parachutist, but that was about all we knew. He'd had so much action in the Middle East, we were amazed that he still wanted to do something different. This time, Lyon opted for an underwater attack using one-man submersible boats. Nicknamed Sleeping Beauties, these highly secret vehicles approached the target just beneath the surface. Limpets were attached and they made good their escape without the fatigue associated with canoes. The target was once again Singapore and after training in Western Australia, the men of Rimau embarked in Her Majesty's submarine Corpus, almost exactly one year after Jaywick's triumphant return. Jerry Goldman, a crewman aboard Porpoise, remembers. We had already done many operations of this type, but much, much smaller. This was by large the largest operation ever undertaken over such a long distance and over such a length of time. Porpoise travelled north, and once again Lyon and his men found themselves in hostile waters. The first phase of the operation involved the capture of a junk, the Mystica. The sleeping beauties and stores were transferred, and the aim was to sail her unobtrusively right into Singapore Harbour. The men from Rimai waved us goodbye, and we proceeded on our way. Very quiet. It was, uh, no fine fares or anything, just so long, goodbye, and best of luck, and off we go. The uh, mission was probably underway, and that's the last we saw or heard of the men from uh, Rimai. They reached Singapore Harbour, and then something went terribly wrong. They were never seen again. The last letter we had from Andrew, he said he was going on a training exercise and that it would be a little while before we heard from him again. But to make sure that we had his 21st birthday cake and all the invitations ready for the big party he wanted when he returned. I remember that he said to us that they had a leader for whom every one of them would be willing to die. Of course, he was referring to Lieutenant Colonel Lyon, who yes. we now know. Operation Rimau. Lieutenant Colonel Lyon, MBE, DSO. Gordon Highlanders, killed in action. Lieutenant Commander Davidson, DSO. Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve, killed in action. Captain Page, DSO, AIF, beheaded. A pickup was to have been made on the 8th of November at Mirapas Island, but the submarine to which this mission had been assigned did not make the rendezvous. It did turn up at the island some two weeks later on an alternative date. A party was sent ashore. There were signs that some people had been on the island and they had left in a hurry. Every member of Operation Rimau perished. Official records show that 10 members were beheaded by the Japanese. The other members of the party disappeared and their disappearance today 
is still shrouded in mystery. Killed in action. Warrant Officer Warren, beheaded. Sergeant Dooley, AIF, beheaded. Sergeant Cameron, AIF, killed in action. Able Seaman Falls, DSM, Royal Australian Navy, beheaded. Able Seaman Marsh, Royal Australian Navy, died of malaria. Able Seaman Houston, DSM, Royal Australian Navy, killed in action. Corporal Campbell, AIF, killed in action. Corporal Stewart, AIF, beheaded. Corporal Kraft, AIF, missing, believed, killed in action. Corporal Fletcher, AIF, beheaded. Lance Corporal Hardy, AIF, beheaded. Lance Corporal Pace, AIF, missing, believed killed in action. Private Warren, AIF, missing.